More than a hundred years ago, the British author H.G. Wells wrote of aliens invading the Earth, and he said, We have learned now that we cannot regard this planet as being fenced in and a secure abiding place for man. We can never anticipate the unseen good or evil that may come upon us suddenly out of space. He could just as well have been talking about cyberspace, the way in which pop-ups, porn sites, promises of fortune and fame appear out of nowhere on our computers and cell phones. Very few adults can handle these temptations. So what about our teenagers? This is time for a story. Once upon a time, there was a young kid called Little Red Riding Hood, or Maria, or Fatima, or Joe. She kissed her mother who stood at the garden gate or went shopping or watched her favorite TV program. Be careful, her mother said, look out for the big bad wolf or words to that effect. But the well-meaning child soon forgot her mother's cautions. Full of good intentions, she made her way through the forest on her own. Enticements popped up everywhere and she became a little distracted. Entranced by her discoveries, she didn't notice that wicked eyes were watching her every movement. Our teens don't see those red gleaming eyes. Not when they're tapping away at their tablets, connecting on Facebook or hooking up to the internet. It's a dangerous world out there. Always has been, always will be. Not most of the time and not in most places, but when bad things happen to children in our community, we don't easily forget them. They stain our memories in red technicolor. Alarmingly, the dangers are no longer out there. The wolves have snuck into our own homes. The wolf comes in through social media, through our smartphones, our smart TVs, and our laptops. Most of the time, social media perform a powerful social function, connecting us to the world, expanding our idea through blogs, podcasts, and even enhancing creativity by setting up joint enterprises. No one would have managed to crisis school our kids through the COVID pandemic without social media. The Arab Spring, the movements to ensure that Black Lives Matter would not have happened without social media. We can't wish social media away, and there are real powerful benefits from using social media in a sensible way. But there are risks, especially for our impulsive, novelty-seeking, curious teenagers. Of course, teenagers today are typically much more savvy than we, their parents are, regarding social media. They typically engage on platforms such as Instagram or Snapchat, leaving Facebook and Twitter largely to the adults. The thing about social media for teenagers is that it's highly appealing, it's addictive, and it encourages us to just do one more click, one more game, to try and get one more level. The gamification of social media, the work by clever people to make sure that it's hard to switch off, is a real risk to our teenagers and their novelty-seeking brains. Some of the risks of social media include excessive use, inappropriate content, Google's memory and online reputation, and of course, cyberbullying and dealing with predators. To talk a little bit about the problem of excessive use, that's really how social media has been engineered by software developers to work. And switching off is really hard, even for adults. For adults, most of us, the first thing they look at in the morning when they wake up is their phone. And the last thing we look at is our phone. And the same for teenagers. It's hard because it feels like turning off your internet is like switching off your connection to your peers. And particularly during times of social distancing during Corona. For teenagers whose relationship to peers is so important for their development, the fear of missing out or FOMO is real. There's pressure to conform to the tribe of peers. And if everyone's on Instagram counting likes, it's hard to be the one who isn't doing that. Of course, we also get issues with teenagers who are not using social media or the internet for social connection, but rather for online gaming. Much online gaming is actually social. And if parents would listen, they would hear that sometimes your teenager who you think is a loner in their bedroom is actually engaging with a world of people out there through their online game. But it is addictive and it's hard to switch off. 
And the only way we can make sure our teenagers do have some balance in their lives is to firstly model to them switching off social media. So we should put our phones away rather than having them open at the dinner table. We should put our phones in a public place to charge and not be carrying them with us everywhere. The digital distraction that comes from trying to do more than one thing at a time, like playing on your phone while having a conversation with your teenager, is really a poor way to think. The multitasking that we think we can do while doing two different social media activities is actually mythical. What we find with excessive use of multiple devices is actually poorer concentration and distractibility. So again, for our teens, we have to model appropriate use of social media. It's absolutely okay to have a social media contract with your teenager that defines the times at which they can be on screens and using them. There's no evidence that excessive use of screens is bad for their eyes as such, but it's certainly not great for having a balanced life. And I think that that's really the most important thing to remember. In terms of the inappropriate content that teens are going to find on social media, I think that's harder in a way to deal with, but also less of a concern. If you have an open, trusting relationship with your teenager, they will either tell you when they see inappropriate content or be able to manage it appropriately. For preteens, you certainly can make use of histories, uh, looking at online histories and programs that allow you to track uh, uh, kids' uh, content and keystroke trackers online. But with teenagers, once they have a smartphone, they have access to everything that's on the internet, good, bad, and completely shocking. I think the most important thing is to have conversations with your teenagers about what they're going to find. I think that the, the most useful way of thinking about it is to know that um, our children are not critical consumers who can effectively tell the difference between reality and fantasy. In the game of life, our role as parents is to be a guardian. It's essential that we educate ourselves about what our children and teenagers are watching, listening to, hopefully reading and talking about. It doesn't mean you have to like it, but you have to know what is going on. So treat your child's first exposures to social media, and this will happen long before they are teenagers. Treat it the same you would as a first date. For a first date, you would probably feel comfortable discussing possible risks and setting limits for behavior. You probably won't think twice about checking up on what they're getting up to, such as arriving a little too early at the house party to fetch them, or keeping in touch with the hosting parents. You are allowed to know what is going on on their social media. It's the same with children's flirtations with social media. Remind them it's a reason why it's called social. It's not private and confidential. Remind them that Google never forgets. A single inappropriate image or comment posted online could be around forever. Just one phone number or address given to a stranger disguised as a friend can set in motion a chain of events over which they have absolutely no control. Just as it's not prying to keep a careful eye on your children's relationships and what they're doing while hanging out at the local mall, it's not intrusive to monitor their use or misuse of the internet or messaging or social media sites. In checking up what your child is doing in cyberspace, you will discover no more or less than what the public knows. Tell your child or your teenager that if they want privacy, then good old fashioned conversation and letter writing are the way to go. Anything else belongs as much to you as to the cyber world out there and in here. One clear way, as I mentioned, is to set up a cell phone or social media contract. These are available widely if you Google them and make very clear what your child's responsibilities are as a user of social media and what steps you're entitled to take to monitor and safeguard them. Of course, your teenager is probably so desperate to have a smartphone that he or she will sign any document, but it's a process. And this type of contract sets out clearly the limits you're prepared to place on time spent in cyberspace, what may or may not be downloaded, when smartphones or laptops or iPads or tablets may be used, and when they have to be turned off. The most important way we can protect our children though, is by educating ourselves about the possibilities and probabilities lurking out there on the web. Not only should we check the websites our children are visiting, 
but with younger children, we can dictate which sites they may visit and use some of the technologies, as I mentioned, like key, keystroke loggers, to limit their access to content we deem appropriate. But by the time our children are teenagers, we have to rely more on building trust with them and little less on monitoring. We need to warn them about predators disguised as promises and help them manage the temptation of instant connection. Hopefully then they will be able to travel more safely down the digital paths of their social networks. In order to also balance the content of what's out there on social media, take time during family meals and times offline to talk about the real heroes in the world. Discuss current events at the dinner table so your children grow up aware of the world. Use this to balance out the seductive anti-heroes of online and video gaming. Teens need to be aware of how to set the highest levels of privacy controls so their posts can't be shared. Remind them that when they post online, they need to think about what anybody else, a future employer, a teacher, a future partner may learn about them and who may see it in future. It's really important to teach children about privacy settings and security setting on their favorite online games, apps, and platforms. Remind them that personal information about themselves is like money. They should value it and protect it. Every time they give permission to a game or an app to collect their information, that information is going to be used to market to them relentlessly. Help them see and understand that. Remind teenagers to secure their devices, to use strong passwords, passcodes, or touch ID features to lock their devices. Securing their phone or their tablet can help protect their information if their device gets lost or stolen and will keep prying eyes out. Remind your kids to be very, very careful of Wi-Fi hotspots, which are not secure, so that if they are hacked, this could happen through a public Wi-Fi um, hotspot. If they use public Wi-Fi a lot, help them look into using a virtual private network that could provide a more secure Wi-Fi connection. Remind your kids also that whether there are links in emails or in posts or online advertising, when in doubt about it, don't open it. These are the ways that hackers, fraudsters um, get access to our personal information. If it looks weird, tell your teen, even if they know the source, it's best to delete. The 24 seven availability of connection on social media and um, smartphones means that kids who are vulnerable to being bullied and harassed are open to being bullied and harassed 24 seven. Cyberbullying is real and painful as is cyber harassment. It's a crime. If you think your child is a victim of cyberbullying, please take it seriously. Go straight uh, with your child to, a, to an authority figure, whether it's a psychologist, someone at the school who can help set a limit. Block people who are bullying your child. Encourage your teenager to tell you about that. And if you, another parent lets you know that your child or your teenager may be um, committing cyberbullying, being, be open to investigating that seriously. It's no help to the world to deny the realities of what your child might be up to. Another concern on social media is that there are predators who use social media to pretend to be who they are not and to try and access things like nude photographs from kids, sex from young girls or boys, and then use that to manipulate or blackmail or torment or harass. Again, help your children be savvy and thoughtful about what they are posting. It's unrealistic to prohibit screen time. And it is important that we can't live in a world of prohibition because social media is out there and it is real and it needs to be used, whether it's for schooling or for social connection. The greatest danger we have is not that our kids will become children of social media, but they will become victims of our own complacency and uncritical parenting. Build trust, build connection, be aware and monitor your own social media use and use it thoughtfully. And then we will all share the best of ourselves online.